Hello again, small engine students. Welcome back to the shop. For this video, what we're going to do is take apart this Craftsman 5.5 horse mower and document the problems that we encounter and the tools that we use and how we're going to do our engine disassembly assignment in small engines. I have my pad of paper, my Sharpie pen that we'll be using to label our components as we go. And before we start taking this engine apart, what I want to do is document some of the tools that we're going to be using. Over here I have some specialty tools laid out. We have our toolbox here with basic hand tools and that's what I'll mostly focus on. But there are a few specialty items that I'll demonstrate, whether it's the strap wrench, um, some of the flywheel pullers. If you look really closely, you'll notice that this, these are shaped, these are from Briggs & Stratton. They're shaped just like the Briggs & Stratton logo. So we'll demonstrate how to use these and then how you would do the job if you don't have those. I also have an uh, oil container here so we can recover and recycle the engine oil. Um, parts trays. So if, if you plan on putting this engine back together, it's really important that you keep your parts organized. So we have parts trays for nuts and bolts. Disposable plastic containers work as well. Keep our hands clean. We've got some mechanics gloves there. And the last thing I want to say is that I have some different products here. Brake clean is really nice to clean up nuts and bolts so you can get your fasteners on them if, if it's pretty dirty. Um, also, I have some PB Blaster and WD-40. If you have really stuck nuts and bolts, stuff that's corroded or rusted on, you're going to need a product like one of these to get those bolts loose. So now that we've taken a look at our setup and the tools we have, let's start by draining the oil on this engine. So just a quick overview on our mower. This was a side of the road fine. People were throwing it away. We grabbed it for class here cleaned it up a little bit so it would show better on the video. It's a Craftsman 5.5 horsepower mower. Now this is not a Briggs & Stratton engine. It's it's uh, kind of a generic manufacturer. In later years, Sears would contract with multiple engine manufacturers to get products built for them. So it's similar to a Briggs uh, flathead engine, but it is different, uh, making it a little bit trickier to get parts for, you'd have to go through Sears.com. Um, very basic engine with basic controls. Not a lot of value to this uh, mower, so rather than try to rebuild it and get it going, we've chosen to use this as an example for disassembly. Okay, I have my safety glasses on because we're going to be underneath the mower. If you pan up here, you can see the underside of this. Here's the lawnmower blade. This has a decent amount of wear on it. Um, there's our drain plug bolt for the engine, and these other bolts are what hold the engine to the mower deck surface. To um, help take apart the engine and make it a little easier and a little bit uh, better for the recording, what I'm going to do is not only drain the oil, but we'll end up taking the mower engine off of the mower deck surface. All right, but let's start by loosening this drain plug. I have a 3 8 ratchet and an extension, and if I look at this plug, this extension just fits in there. I'm a big proponent of using extensions wherever possible because it helps keep your hands away from the work surface where you might hurt yourself. Okay, we've loosened it up. I'm only going to go like a turn or so. Now I need to get my drain pan in place so I can properly drain the oil and catch it in the pan. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make sure that the mower blades are out of the way. Okay, um, we've got the oil drain. I'm going to take the mower blade off and then unbolt the mower from the deck. Now, to get this bolt loosened up, I could just impact it off because I do have an impact gun and that would work well. However, I want to use hand tools to kind of simulate how you might do it at home. 
So I'm going to hit this bolt with a little bit of penetrating oil, WD-40 or, or PV blaster or the equivalent. And I'm going to use these vice grip pliers, these locking pliers, to basically stop the blade from spinning by clamping them to the side of the mower deck surface. That will prevent it from rotating and then I can break that bolt loose. So let's lock on these pliers. Okay, with the pliers locked on, the blade will come down and get stuck on the pliers and that will prevent it from rotating. To help myself out, I'm going to use a half inch drive wrench or half inch drive ratchet to get this guy loosened up. The longer you let the penetra penetrating oil soak, the more work it will do for you and the easier it will make your job loosening stubborn fasteners. With the mower blade out of the way, we can now see the mount that holds the blade on the position. That mount uh, should come off of there um, with slight downward pressure, but oftentimes you might have to use a puller um, to pull it off of there. Now a, um, a three-jaw puller or a two-jaw puller can commonly be rented from the auto parts store for free if you need a puller. Sometimes you can just take a hammer and tap it off, but we're going to go ahead and take the mower off the mower deck so that we can view that a little bit easier. Let's get these mower deck bolts down. Okay, as I'm taking the mower deck off, let me talk about the fasteners. Knowing that this was a copy of a Briggs & Stratton, and it was probably made overseas, I figured that these fasteners would be metric. But what I'm finding is that they're actually standard. So I'm using a half inch drive socket on these ones, and on the blade, I use the 9 16 size. These were pretty stubborn, so I had to spray them with penetrating oil and then break them loose with a half inch drop. Once you get them spun down a little bit, you should be able to get them broke free by finger. One, or spun off by finger, I should say. One interesting thing that I noticed is that one of the mounting bolts was broken on this engine. At this point, once we take off the controls up top, we should be able to pull the mower engine off the mower deck. Let's go up top. Okay, so undoing the controls. This engine doesn't have a lot. It's got the, the engine kill slash brake assembly here, and it's got the pull starter. It actually has a fixed throttle down below, so we only have two things to undo. With the pull starter, I'm just going to slip that out, slip the rope out of position. I might have to take a screwdriver and bend that out just a tab. With this guy, I just have to wiggle him out there, then I'm going to cut the zip tie. Engine kill assembly. already done the pull starter so this engine's ready to come off of here and there it is okay now that we have the mower off the deck I want to point out I've made a little stand here to help me hold this thing in place as I work on it however I could have kept that engine on the mower deck to take it off a lot of these external components. And for you at home, that's probably going to be easier. I just felt like having the engine separated would, would video a little bit better and make it easier for you to see the components. So I'm going to lift this engine in and put it on my stand I've built. And now I have it super accessible 
to show you on the video. The other thing I'm going to do, just to speed up the disassembly, is I am going to use my little electric air ratchet. Um, these new lithium-ion electric tools are super nice. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that before we were talking about how um, the engine had some standard bolts in the bottom, well, what I'm finding is more metric fasteners on top. So this thing definitely is a mix of both metric and standard. So with that removed, I've already drained the gas tank. I'll pull off the fuel line, and now we can take off the plastic fuel tank assembly. Those are pretty common when they get about oh, five or six years old. They begin to crack and leak. and So if you have an older engine, watch the fuel tank. It's very likely that it will start to leak on it. We're going to put our parts in parts containers to keep them organized. And now we're going to take off the blower housing. I've removed some bolts from the front. I'm going to get this 10 millimeter in the back here. Now, if you're a tool hound like me, you're probably thinking, hey, that little electric air ratchet's pretty nice. Um, if you're a college student, whether it's at American River College at my school or any good community college or even high school auto program, you can buy Snap-on tools, Maco tools, and Mac tools often for huge discounts. So if you are a Votech student, ask your uh, shop teacher about the Votech discount and you can buy some tools just like this for really great prices. Okay, we're taking off the oil tube and its bolt, and now I can take the pull starter assembly off. Now this engine was pretty dirty. We did some pre-cleaning with a pressure washer, again, just to make it look a little nicer for the video. Um, I'm going to take off the air filter. This air filter looks pretty mangled. Whenever you take off an air filter, look underneath the air filter and look to see if dirt is below the filter element. If there is dirt below the filter element, that tells you that the engine has been ingesting dirt. That's going to cause quite a bit of wear pretty rapidly to your engine. So if you have a suspicion that you have low compression, look for dirt under the air filter. If you find it, that's a good reason as to why you have uh, low compression in your engine. Okay, with the air filter removed, I'm going to take off the air filter mount and the carburetor assembly and the muffler. So we got the muffler off, the air cleaner base. Now we can get the intake manifold and carburetor off. Okay, so we're finding all kinds of interesting stuff here. This engine's using a mix of metric and standard. This other intake manifold bolt, I can't put a socket on it because of the shape of the manifold. So I do have to use a wrench, in this case a 3 8 wrench, and try to get it just one quarter turn at a time. And sometimes that's the case. You just can't get a socket on there and you have to use a wrench and you just have to keep your patience take your time if you keep moving it out a little bit at a time eventually you'll get it off of it. okay we're going to remove the carburetor and the intake manifold as an assembly but I do need to disconnect it from the governor system. So if you can zoom in on the governor and these lines, I really want to show you uh, what's, what's going on. So one, this line right here that's going to the crankcase. This is your crankcase breather hose. Its job is to prevent those crankcase vapors from going to the atmosphere. So it, it helps reduce emissions from the engine. But it also helps keep the oil cleaner 
uh, for a longer period of time because it's purging those vapors. So I just disconnected that crankcase vapor system. And now I can begin to disconnect my uh, throttle link and governor spring. So if you are going to put this engine back together, it's going to run again. Be very careful to not bend these links or overstretch this spring. So I just got the link off of there. I'll now get the spring undone and take this off as an assembly. Now I can see here's my governor link where it goes to the shaft going inside the motor. So that's what's left of the governor assembly. We'll go ahead and take off the valve spring box and the ignition coil here next. There's my valve spring box. Ignition coil. Here's my kill switch. Remember, if this switch were pinched to ground this wire, it would keep the engine from having any spark. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and take off the spark plug and take off the cylinder. Here's a tip on taking off the cylinder head. If I'm going back together and I want to be careful not to work the cylinder head, I'm going to go in a reverse torque pattern, meaning that I'm going to start on the outside and then I'm going to work my way to the inside. So I've just cracked that loose. I'm now going to go to this guy over here. I'm going to crack him loose. Notice I'm using a half inch drive so I have a little bit more length and a little bit more leverage. So now I've cracked all of these loose and I've done it very smoothly and evenly as to try to minimize any potential workage. Now I'll spin them off with the ratchet. Sometimes you have something that's hard to grab. Having a pocket extendable magnet, really nice tool to have in your toolbox. So I have all the fasteners loosened up and removed, but I can't get the head off. That's because the head gasket is sealing the top of the cylinder head to the, to the engine block. A couple hits with the dead blow hammer will help us break this free. I really don't want to take a screwdriver and pry in there and pry it apart because I could break off one of these cooling fans. So one thing you'll notice is that this engine was probably being stored at an angle. It's all full of oil in the cylinder head. And again, this is a flat head, so there's no valves up in the, in the cylinder head. The valves are down here in the engine block. You can also see how the head gasket ripped apart when I removed the head. That's pretty normal. A head gasket is generally a gasket. You're going to have to replace it every time you take the engine apart and put it back together. It's not a reusable gasket by any means. Now that I have the cylinder head off, let's go ahead and rotate this motor just for fun and run it through the four-stroke cycle. You'll notice that there's two valves here. The intake valve is here on the bottom. It's the bigger valve. Nine times out of ten, if you're trying to figure out which valve is which, the intake's going to be your bigger valve because you have less of a pressure differential on the intake side of the engine than you do on the exhaust. So if I rotate this engine through its normal four-stroke cycle, you can see piston starts moving down on the intake stroke, and the intake valve begins to open up. Gets to around bottom and center of the intake stroke, intake valve's closing, piston starts coming up on the compression stroke, and there we are, top dead center compression. Piston begins to move down on the power stroke. Both valves are closed. We get near bottom dead center of the exhaust stroke, and guess what? The exhaust valve starts to open. Piston keeps coming up. Now we're going up on the exhaust stroke, and we're getting right to top dead center again. 
as the exhaust stroke ends and the intake stroke begins. Now, it's probably a little hard to see with the camera, but we'll do our best to zoom in. I'm going to take a piece of paper here, and what you'll notice is that top dead center of the intake stroke, I can just barely slip the piece of paper in the exhaust, and I can slip it past the intake valve. Even this engine has a little bit of what they call valve overlap, where both the intake valve and the exhaust valve is open just a little bit. What that does is it helps as the exhaust gases are flowing out of the engine, it helps draw air fuel mixture into the engine so you have a good charge on the intake stroke of the four stroke cycle. So that's valve overlap in action. It happens right at the end of the exhaust stroke and the beginning of the intake stroke in the four stroke cycle. Now that we've reviewed these cycles, now it's time for us to take this flywheel off. So let's do that next. So this flywheel nut is probably going to be the most difficult fastener on your entire engine. These are torqued down from the factory anywhere from the low side of maybe 35 pounds to 65 pounds. So there's more torque on this one bolt than any other bolt on the motor. To help us out, again, we're going to hit it with some penetrating lubricant and let that soak in and work a little while. We're, we're next going to break that free. I'm going to do this a couple different ways to show you some different options. Okay, so what I'm going to set up for my first attempt here of loosening the flywheel nut is I have a strap wrench. This is actually the factory recommended tool. I lasso it around. What I like about it is it's non-marring. It doesn't tear up the flywheel at all. This flywheel is a little fragile here with these cooling fins, um, but this strap wrench shouldn't damage those. Now, it looks kind of weird. A lot of times I'll have students and they want to put it on there with that cup going towards the flywheel. That's not actually how this guy is designed to work. This guy is designed so that he folds on into himself to prevent you from spinning it under the tension of the strap wrench. The other thing I've done is I got my half inch drive, but I got a little bit longer half inch drive ratchet this time. You might even want to use a breaker bar. And so with these two, I should be able to hold one and push the other away from myself and break this free. No problem. Okay, another method if you're really having problems with this bolt will be to take it to a shop where they have compressed air and can use an air impact gun. With the air gun, it hits it so hard and so quickly, you can just hold this with your hand and impact it right off of there. We're going to take this off one, one more way to give you one more option of removing this fastener. Okay, for the third option, what we're going to do to prevent the engine from rotating, is I'm going to take some paper towel and put that down the cylinder. I'll push this piston towards bottom dead center, and with this paper towel in place, I'm going to put my cylinder head back on. Now, I have three or four fasteners. That should be sufficient. As I rotate the engine, the piston will push up against the paper towel. It will compress against the cylinder head, and that will prevent the engine from rotating. Let me tighten up these head bolts. Okay, so I have the paper towel inside the cylinder. I start to rotate the engine, and the piston comes up and presses against the paper towel, and it cannot rotate. So I'm holding the engine by my paper towel piston stop, if you will. I can now break this flywheel nut free and take it apart. So now I've shown you multiple ways to take the flywheel nut off. We're not out of the woods yet though. We have to get the flywheel off of the end of the crankshaft. And this is tricky because the end of the crankshaft is tapered and so it's a tapered pressed fit as these two pieces come together. Pause. Okay, here's an example of a crankshaft. Um, this is from a Honda clone engine. And you can see that this is tapered, meaning that it 
it starts off wider and narrows down to a smaller size as it gets towards the end. That wedges the flywheel to the crankshaft. It does have a crank key, but actually when it's all torqued down and put together, it, the key is only for location. It doesn't hold the two pieces from spinning with one another. So I have to break this free. Now on Briggs & Stratton engines, there's threaded holes and I can put my flywheel puller in place. If I threaded this guy down and I tightened each one of these bolts down, it would slowly push down on this and pull the flywheel off of there. But if we look at this flywheel, what you'll notice is that there's three threaded or there's three holes, but they're not actually threaded. It's this engine is so inexpensive, they figured, well, you'll probably throw it away, not rebuild it. So if I wanted to use a puller on it, I would need some type of um, a uh, steering wheel puller that gave me three attachment points and I would have to tap threads in these holes. Let me show you the type of puller we would use for this flywheel. So this is a steering wheel puller kit and notice that it's got multiple different attachments I can use. With the three slots there what I could do is tap those holes with the tap and die kit, put in three bolts and use this style of puller to take this guy apart. Okay, so. Like I said, that's a, a steering wheel puller kit. This is kind of an inexpensive model, but that would more than get the job done. But there's an easier way to take this flywheel off, and that's what I want to show you guys. Out of all my different methods to remove the flywheel, this tends to be my students' favorites. Now, on engines that are worth quite a bit of money, or they have an expensive flywheel for that matter, they actually make what they call flywheel knocker tools that thread on the engine and you can then tap on the tool and get that to get the flywheel to pop off of there. But this engine doesn't match my tool first of all and secondly it's not worth a lot of money so what I'm going to do just to protect the threads I'm going to put that flywheel nut back on and I'm going to thread him down to, so he's even with the top surface of the flywheel. Next what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide an upward um, pressure with my hand. I'm kind of lifting up on the flywheel. Then I'm going to take a hammer and I'm going to hit down on it. And that vibration forcing it down will actually get the flywheel to pop up. So let's see how many hits it's going to take. Getting close. There it is. At this point, I can take that nut back off of there. It was a little tight because of all the hammering on the threads. And now I can pull the flywheel off. Now, one thing you'll notice on the inside of this flywheel, there's some rubbing motions. That's the brake assembly. Remember, this is a lawnmower engine. So when you t let go of the emergency stop, not only does it kill the ignition, but it puts the brakes on the flywheel. That's a safety standard that came about more than 20 years ago now to help keep the operator of the lawnmower safe. So flywheel is now off, and now we can really start to brake apart this engine. Okay, so now we're going to take off the brake assembly and it's uh, supporting bracketry. I'm going to take off the keyway for my flywheel. At this point, I'm going to stand the block up so I can get to the bottom bolts. Before we split the cases and take the side cover off, we need to get this mower blade attachment off of the PTO shaft or end of the crankshaft. So one method that you can use is just tapping on this a little bit at a time 
working it back and forth, I've already soaked it with penetrating oil. And if I just keep doing this back and forth, back and forth, eventually I will get this unit off of there. Another way that you could remove this would be to use a three-jaw puller like I've set up here. Um, in fact, even a two-jaw puller would work pretty good on this, on this particular flywheel. Okay, so the puller didn't seem to be give it a budge. I couldn't pry it off. This is worst case scenario. So what I'm going to do is take an angle grinder and cut a slit in the side of this and hammer it off. There we go. That's the worst case scenario, but sometimes that's what you have to do to get these off the end of the crankshaft. Now, I'm almost ready to take the cover off, but I do need to clean the end of the crankshaft. I'll start with the rag. And clean the end of the crankshaft that way. But remember, this is going to be my main bearing surface in this cover. So I really have to get this clean and free of any debris. So to do that, I'm going to take a little bit of emery cloth or sandpaper and just lightly clean the end of the crankshaft. You can see how rusted and pitted it is. That's pretty common with the mower that's been in service for a long time. I'll now take the side cover bolts off. Okay, now we can see inside this engine. So now we have our side cover removed and we've done a little bit of cleaning on our engine parts. We actually had to cut off the mower blade attachment because it had rusted to the crankshaft, which is kind of a worst case scenario, but you do have to do that sometimes. Now that we have the pieces apart, we can go ahead and take our piston and connecting rod and crankshaft assembly out as well as our, our camshaft and other parts. In fact, the camshaft will slide out right now. So you can see the camshaft design. This is kind of a unique motor. It does not use a traditional oil slinger device. It actually has kind of like a little oil pump that moves back and forth on it. We'll zoom in on that in just a minute. So here's this side cover. And here's the oil pump. So it goes to the end of the camshaft, and you can see that it sits very low in the case and oil could go into it from either spot. If I put this guy back together, what you'll see is that it moves that plunger back and forth, and that would bring oil up through the hollow camshaft and bring it to the top where it would then spread out over all the internal engine components. So kind of a unique oiling situation on this one. You can see the some channels there cut to bring oil to the to the main bearing surface area right on that PTO end. So camshafts out here, 
Um, this is the compression release mechanism, which actually got damaged on this assembly. Um, here's your governor system with the flyweight. So remember, as this thing spins, the flyweights move out. And as the flyweights move out, the plunger moves out. So if I push that in again and I spin it, you'll see how centrifugal force makes that thing move outward. And that's how it's going to limit the engine's top no-load speed. Let's put these parts to the side for a minute and focus on the actual disassembly of our engine. So the last two parts we have to take out here are the piston, connecting rod, and crankshaft here. And I just need to position this towards the bottom of its stroke. Notice that they've moved it to the side so that the, um, it clears this, this crankcase breather. They've, they've moved the parting line of the rod. So it looks like we have two 8 millimeters. We'll take those out and then get this thing all apart. Well, it got me again. It's actually a standard size on these bolts. This motor has been pretty interesting because it's been using several metric bolts and a mix of standard in different locations. It reminds me of working on a 1980s American car where you would have some metric, some standard, just to keep you on your toes, I guess. So we're getting these bolts loosened up. I used a wrench so that you could see what I was doing. A ratchet would work, a little quarter inch drive ratchet would work really nicely as well. But once you get the bolts broke loose, they should have come apart pretty easily there. We'll get those put in our container. So there's our rod cap. I'm going to push our rod up at this point. I should be able to take our crankshaft out. Here's our crank gear or sprocket. And now I should be able to push the piston and rod assembly out of the cylinder bore. take a look at everything. Okay, so I've taken out our piston and rod assembly. I just removed the wrist pin clip. I'm going to pull out the wrist pin now. So there's our wrist pin. Here's our piston. Our connecting rod assembly. You can see the, the grooves cut in it for lubrication. We got our rings over here. This is our oil control ring. This is our wiper ring, our, our middle ring. And then this is our top compression ring. The engine's all taken apart. Um, I have two items left in here, the crankcase breather. And this right here is the governor arm. So you, you can see where it goes through the outside of the case. And that's where it goes on the inside. Now, when you put the engine together, this arm sits more up like this. And if we think about the other, the other end of this, how the governor works, this case is, of course, pushing down. And as the governor moves out, right, as that moves out, it pushes down on this governor crank which moves the governor lever this in this case it's going clockwise so it moves the governor lever clockwise and that would in turn close the throttle so when you do the static adjustment just as a governor side note what you're doing is you're getting this governor crank this pad right here right up against this surface right there all right with all the pieces taken apart and um, disassembled, 
what I would like to do is is lay it lay all the components out and label them just like you're going to do for your project. Okay, before everything's labeled, we do have one more thing to take apart. Those are our valve lifters or tappets. We have to get these valve springs out of the the side case of the engine or the valve box, if you will. And there is a technique to doing that. Now to put the springs back in, it would require a valve spring compressor. However, with um, removal, all we really need is a flathead screwdriver. With the flathead screwdriver, you can kind of walk around the valve spring retainer. And on a Briggs engine, there's a couple of notches that you can line up to get the spring to come off. Now, I don't see those notches on this engine, but just the same, I should be able to walk this spring over and get it, get the valve spring retainer shifted over and move the spring out. Yep, we're almost there. There we go. And if the valve's not mushroomed over, it should pull out just like so. This one actually is, doesn't look too bad. You can see the carbon buildup on the valve. I can now pull the valve spring out. the valve spring retainer and you'll see what I was trying to do there I had to get it to this larger opening here to get it shifted over and unfortunately on a Briggs engine they give us a little notch so we can kind of see where we're at this engine didn't but we got it off of there and then up in the top here is your um, valve stem seal looks like it's a block on this particular engine so let's get the other spring out and I'm just kind of feeling for where that big area is to get the spring lowered down there we go I can pull the spring out of the or the valve out of the valve guide I got the spring on the end of my screwdriver, valve spring retainer, and we'll take out the valve guide plate, and you'll see that for the intake valve, it's got a valve stem seal on there, so the engine doesn't suck oil past the intake valve, and then here's the one for the exhaust valve. So valve guide plate with valve stem seal. Our two valves, intake and exhaust, the valve springs, and their retainers, and we've taken all of those out of the valve box. Now, if we wanted to put all this back together, again, we would need a spring compressor to squeeze these springs in there and load all our components. All right, now let's go ahead with the labeling. Okay, you can see that we have all of our parts laid out on the table and labeled. We'll go over them. So we have our intake manifold and carburetor, then our governor spring and the throttle link, our air filter, which you can see the poor condition it was in, fuel tank, pull starter assembly, flywheel and ignition coil, our starter cup, this had a unique little oil pump mechanism, cylinder head, piston ring, or not piston rings, piston, crankshaft, wrist pin, connecting rod. There's our piston rings with our oil control, our middle or wiper ring, and our top compression ring. Here's our engine block with governor arm still inside. And of course that has our cylinder, so it might be called your cylinder or your engine block. Bottom crankcase assembly that still has the governor mechanism in it. 
And then moving on to some of the smaller parts, we have our muffler, our blade attachment, oil fill, valve cover plate. Here's our valves, both exhaust and intake, springs, retainers, tappets or lifters as they're called. There's our camshaft. And then this is our safety lever. It has our uh, flywheel brake on it and ignition kill and then all of our nuts and bolts. So with that, we've labeled all our parts and you can see all the components of your four-stroke cycle outdoor power equipment, in this case, lawnmower engine. Okay, so that's our engine disassembly and labeling. You can see that this is a pretty big project and that's why it's worth quite a few points. Um, it, it's just a great activity to do. There's nothing like getting your hands on the parts to help you learn how things work and go together. In our in-person class at the school, it, it's actually harder than this because you not only have to get the engine all the way apart and label it like this, but you have to put it all the way back together and get it running. For our online class, I'm not asking you to get it back together. So you could put all this stuff in the scrap metal bin or you could hang it on the wall of your garage uh, for memories. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope this helps you on your engine disassembly. And I look forward to seeing your pictures and images and engine parts as you get things disassembled. Until next time, keep working on things.